So I'm a physicist by background, studied in, in Sydney and then for a postdoc went over to the University of Southampton in the UK. There I really got um, a real buzz from understanding how people from one field could make a huge impact by crossing across fields. So when I went there I was largely a theoretical physicist in the field of photonics and I got a chance to work with some of the fabrication and experimentalists um, there to be able to chart new directions for some of that fabrication work in, in the field of optical fibres because I brought some of the theoretical background that was not there. Over time I got a chance to, to broaden out and to play um, in quite a range, wide range of application areas and it was precisely for this reason that we've talked about, going beyond competitive grants. So picture this, I was there, 25, fresh out of a PhD, employed, as many of you may be, to work on someone else's grant, an EPSRC grant, a bit like an ARC grant. I had a three-year contract, I was in his lab, fantastic mentor, but I was in his lab to deliver something of use of value to that grant. But, you know, there were many things I wanted to drive, and I, to do that, you needed people. How do you get people? You need funding. How do you get funding? Well, just like here, you apply for a competitive grant, it takes you months to write it, it, takes you most of another year to find out if you've got it, then you probably find out you haven't got it, and honestly, I didn't have the patience. So we, and one of the beautiful advantage I had there was it would never be that we had a week go by without somebody coming through the lab. Because I was in you know, one of the world's best recognised centres for optoelectronics research, we'd have companies, big and small, coming through many days of the week. Sometimes there were big companies that had established partnerships with the centre. Sometimes there were small companies that might have been spun out of research previously at the centre. So there was an ecosystem that had strong relationships between the industry and the research. And that's something I think we need to do everything we can to build here in Australia and in South Australia. But anyway, there I was, 25-year-old researcher, having people coming through my labs. You start a conversation, you engage, you try and understand their need, as my colleagues have said. You pitch them something and gosh, the adrenaline rush when two weeks later they send you an email back saying, yes, I want it, where do we sign? So for me, that joy really that comes from partnering with people who care about what you're doing <laughs> is profound. And I built a team of seven or eight people within a few months from those partnerships and you can do that too. But it's harder if you're not in a place where those opportunities exist and sometimes you have to reach out and create them. So then, um, fast wind, I was brought here to Adelaide just over 10 years ago as the inaugural chair of photonics at Uni of Adelaide. And, you know, I started trying to get a range of funding support to grow that research capability. And in the early times, it was predominantly defence funding. I was brought out as a DSTO chair. So they paid my salary. They paid a startup package for me to have a couple of postdocs. But if I just sat back and said, I was brought out as a DSTO chair, DSTO will provide the research funding required to sustain this, I could have done that. <laughs> it would have been very different where we ended up. In fact, it's interesting to note that at the same time I was brought out as a chair to set up this centre of expertise in photonics, another UK professor was brought out to start up another centre of expertise. And he took a different approach. He had more of an approach that this is a defence-focused activity and I'll be here to be receptive to defence research. I took an approach that said, look, I want to set up a fabrication facility, I want to set up the capacity to make new kinds of optical fibres and make new types of optical glass that don't exist in Australia. That's an expensive undertaking. I need people, I need technical people, I need physicists, material scientists, chemists, I need a big team. I know it's unrealistic to expen expect my primary sponsor to fund that. What else can I do? What are the sexy ideas I can put to the ARC? What are the really pragmatic things that I can do with some of the local industry? How do you build a portfolio that will allow you to sustain that? And then I remember very clearly, you know, uh, and I'll give you a couple of quick examples, but being tapped on the shoulder by defence and being asked to lead a bid for a, a defence research centre. And given that I was brought into a leadership role in defence, I thought, OK, I'll do that. And so I reached out to colleagues around Australia and in fact, I um, reached out to the University of Sydney where I'd done my PhD because I knew they had a facility for making silica optical fibres that would be critical for this defence centre. 
and asked them to join this bid. As part of asking them to join the bid, I learned a little bit ahead of the public announcement that they'd been slated for shutdown. Now, they had four or five million dollars worth of publicly funded infrastructure that was going to be disestablished. Um, and so I went back to my supporters in DSTO, I went to state government and I said, look, this is an interesting situation we have. We have this capability at Sydney Uni. It's going to be shut down. What do we do? And in conversation with the Defence Unit, which is now called Defence SA in government in here in South Australia, we came to the realisation that um, it made sense to try and retain this capability for the future of defence industries in Australia. We worked through with people in Sydney whether it was possible to leave it where it was. That turned out to be financially not viable um, because it was in very expensive rented premises at the um, near Redfern station. And so the long and the short of it is, is Defence SA agreed to fund um, the cost of reinstalling that equipment here in Adelaide. Now, this all proceeded apace. We had the end users agreeing to put up a couple of million to do that. And then I got the news that we were not successful in getting the centre. Now I share this because I think quite often when you look at the careers of successful researchers, you don't see the failures that are actually pivotal in shaping the careers. You only see the successes and you think I couldn't do that. But that was the best failure that ever happened to me. Okay, because essentially I then went back to the supporter in state government and said, look, thank you for your generosity. Thank you for your support into this bid, but I'm really sorry to say we were not funded. And his response was, well, you convinced me it was a good idea for South Australian industry, yeah? I bought that. Should we do it anyway? And he left his money in, which then formed the basis for me going out cap in hand, convincing a wider set of people to put in the matching funds that ended up leading to us winning the competitive funding to build the Braggs building at the University of Adelaide, which became the headquarters for a new institute, IPAS, and that then created something much bigger out of what was a very pragmatic thing, which was me responding to a request to apply for a defence research centre. Now I'm going to fast wind and I apologise for monopolising, but I'll be quick. I'll fast wind to another example that gets to the so what for me personally. I remember, it was probably five, six years ago now, being asked to give a talk on the future of biophotonics research at Bioinnovation SA, which many of you all know. And I remember thinking about it, and by that time I'd won discovery projects, linkage projects, NHMRC projects, range of things. Had my, you know, Federation Fellowship. I, you know, got into the Academy of Technological Sciences, you know, and thought, what is it I'm trying to prove? What in 10 years, what about if in 10 years time I feel like I've just been still doing that same thing, just winning competitive grants? I was acutely conscious at that time that it was a lot easier for me to win money to pursue a new sexy idea than it was to take something you've already demonstrated in the lab and get it out. And, you know, this is something that I think is a little broken in the Australian system that once you get to the point of having a good track record, it is easier to just keep coming up with new ideas than translating the ones that are already demonstrated in the lab. So I thought, no, I, I'm not happy to just continue doing what I'm doing. And if I, in the future, can't look back and feel that some of the good work our team's done is actually out there making a difference, I don't feel I've succeeded. So that kind of changed my focus and um, really led me to have different types of conversations. And for me, where my, my so what is based on my field, which is essentially working in physics and particularly working in photonics, we have this wonderful capacity to use light to answer questions. So my question I'd always ask an end user is, what is it that you've always wanted to be able to measure that you currently can't measure? <laughs> Free your mind, don't worry about what technology you can buy or what equipment's available that might be, you know, a legacy of the physics from generations past. What is it you'd want to measure that you currently can't measure? And for me, the best quick case study of this was, you know, 10 plus years ago, when I first came out to Australia, charged with doing research to support defence. One of the relationships I built was with um, DSTO researcher in Mel researchers in Melbourne, who wanted to be able to measure corrosion in aircraft. 
they wanted to have a, a system that could allow you to probe whether an aircraft was rusting without you having to disassemble it, which is the current practice. So we started trying to work on optical fibres that could be embedded within an aircraft structure and then using pulses of light through those fibres be able to interrogate where aluminium corrosion was occurring. Now this is very pragmatic but also incredibly ambitious. And we are actually currently working on delivering the final demonstrator that will sit in DSTO to show people how the technology works. But along the way, we had to develop new kinds of optical fibres. And, you know, just to tell you the journey, I remember standing in the wine centre at some networking function and, and I was really buzzing because just that day we'd been able to detect aluminium ions and where they were along the fibre. And so I was just, you know, as you are when something works for a change and, and I was at this networking function and somebody said, why are you so happy? And I said, oh, we just detected, you know, aluminium ions. Ah, oh, interesting. I work in wine. Could you detect things in wine? So a year later, we had an ARC linkage grant with three local companies to develop smart bungs for wine barrels. And we've just um, developed some wireless bungs, actually, that can measure a range of properties in the wine. Then that led to us detecting hydrogen peroxide in the wine and trigger another glass of wine, another networking function. And I happened to get into a random conversation with someone and they said, what have you been doing lately? And I said, we've just detected hydrogen peroxide. Oh, I work with embryos. We'd love to be able to detect hydrogen peroxide around an embryo. So we went from something that seems pragmatic, detecting corrosion, to being able to work on putting an optical fibre next to a single developing embryo to listen to it developing and in a sense that nucleated the centre of excellence that kicked off late last year which is really focused on nanophotonic technologies that are capable of measuring things that are happening at a single cell level within the human body. But wait that's not enough right so the original project on corrosion developed a new technology a new um, distributed fibre brag grating technology that we then um, secured some ARC support to develop as an endometrial sensor. And the wonderful postdoc who was working on that as a super science fellow found a new way to write these gratings. And when we had a bit of a chat, we realised that these gratings should be able to work at very high temperatures because of the, just the physical characteristics of these gratings. Now, because um, working with state government, um, we'd have been able to create a scheme for bringing small companies in and asking them, what would you like to measure? We were able to um, figure out that actually the smelter at Port Pirie had no way of directly measuring the temperature of the molten metal in the smelter and thus managing the smelter processes and managing the energy costs. And so just in the last few months, those, that same technology has been now used to demonstrate the highest ever optical temperature detection which could transform the way smelters operate. So, you know, for me, I guess the so what is being able to change the way something is measured and done and getting it out of the lab and actually making a difference to industry. And along that journey, you know, it's an expensive business doing that type of research. The critical nature of getting um, non-competitive funding has been to be able to do those quite pragmatic things that you often can't sell to competitive funding agencies. So I apologise for abbreviating that, but I just wanted to give you a glimpse because I think all of our so what's are different, but some things unite them. And one of them is passion um, and engaging with people rather than just almost using the proposal as the barrier between us and conversation.